Thank you, ladies. Take your Bibles, if you would, turn to the book of 2 Peter, chapter number 1. 2 Peter, chapter number 1. This is Memorial Day. The title of the message this morning is, One Word, Remember. Remember. 2 Peter, chapter number 1. Just a couple of verses to get us started. Start reading with me, if you would, at verse number 12. Peter writing this epistle says, 2 Peter 1, 12, Wherefore I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them, and be established in this present truth. Yea, I think it meet, as long as I am in this tabernacle, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. Just notice Peter's emphasis that some things need to be remembered. He acknowledges in verse number 12, you already know these things, but they need to be stirred up. They need to be brought back to your memory. Of course, Peter, not talking about a national holiday, he's talking about Christians need to remember some things. As a matter of fact, if you'll look backwards just a little bit, look at verse number 9, he says, He that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Bible teaches it's very important for us to remember some things. Memorial Day is actually Remembrance Day. We've got several days in our calendar where we acknowledge and try to recognize those that have fought for our country. For example, Veterans Day. We've got several veterans that are here with us today, and we're honored that you're here with us. Veterans Day is the day nationally when we stop to thank the vets for their service to our country. Memorial Day is a different day. Veterans, we can thank them because they came back home. Memorial Day, we're remembering those who did not get to come back home. Those that paid the ultimate price. I know I've given you the history of Memorial Day before, but let me give it to you again, as Peter says. Let's remind ourselves what we're doing today. For this day is much more than just a day of fun, a day of fellowship. It's a day to remember. Memorial Day, where did it came from? The first Memorial Day actually wasn't called Memorial Day. It was called Decoration Day. The first time that it was celebrated as a national holiday was back in May the 9th of 1865. 1865, that was just three years after the Civil War ended. The Civil War ended on, excuse me, I got the dates backwards. First time Decoration Day was celebrated was May the 30th, 1868. The war ended May the 9th, 1865. So just three years after the Civil War ended. This holiday, this Decoration Day, came to pass because communities had started going to the cemeteries and on those days they would decorate the graves, both the Union and the Confederate graves of those that had died in the Civil War. The first time that it was celebrated, 1868, General Garfield had gathered up about 5,000 that heard him speak. And then they went in the National Arlington Cemetery and they decorated over 20,000 Confederate and Union soldier graves that day. So it was called Decoration Day. And so it continued for many years. With each new war, they simply added more people that they remembered. By the end of World War I, Memorial Day eventually became a day to recognize all those in all the wars of America that had ever died. It wasn't actually called Memorial Day until 1971. In 1971, our Congress created the national holiday. The last Monday of the month of May is now Memorial Day, a day that we remember all those that have given their life for our country. It's kind of hard to figure up how many people have given their lives for our country. We've had so many wars. As a matter of fact, the earlier wars, nobody was keeping account. So we don't even have records of how many people died fighting in some of the first wars of our country. And then some people want to count things a little different. Some people say, well, we should only count on Memorial Day those who actually gave their life fighting for our country. While others say, no, anybody that in any way gave their life for our country ought to be included. And then kind of sadly, for the last 60, 70 years, we don't have wars anymore. We have conflicts. We have actions. But if you were to count and estimate everyone that has died in the fight to deliver our country, 
the figure amounts to approximately 43 million men and women that have died fighting to keep America free. To me, that's an astonishing number. 43 million in 241 years of our country's existence. This day, Memorial Day, it's really not a biblical holiday. That is, it's not given to us out of the Bible, but I think it's a good day for us. I think it's a good day for us in the church to stop and remember. That's what it's for. A day to remember. To remember what? To remember that freedom isn't free. To remember that some gave their all that you and I might enjoy the freedoms that we've got in our country. But not just to remember the price that has been paid, I think it also does us good to remember that the price continually has to be paid. That vigilance is required and that continually we must defend the freedoms that we so greatly cherish. But then third, I think it's important that we remember the people that actually did give their lives. So this is an important day. It's a day to remember. And as a church, we want to acknowledge that. However, I'm not a preacher of national holidays. I'm a preacher of the Scripture. And so instead of talking any more about Memorial Day, that day when we remember as a nation those that have given their lives for their country, let's go back to what Peter was saying. Peter said as believers, there's some things that you and I need to remember. This morning, what are some of those things that as Christians, even as American Christians, you and I need to remember. Let me give you three as I have time this morning. Number one, we need to remember that we have enemies. Now, again, I'm not talking nationally now. I'm talking spiritually. We have enemies. Our nation does have enemies. It's a little bit hard for me to comprehend being an American who has spent literally all my life in the country of the United States of America. It's hard for me to imagine, but I know it to be true. Some people hate America and they hate Americans just because we are Americans. That's incomprehensible for me, but I know it to be true. This political term that we've created today, this uh, radical Islam, and, and I don't want to stir anything up political, but Raslam, uh, radical Muslims, radical Islam is a group of people who simply desire to hate America. They want to eliminate Americans. It's hard to imagine, hard to comprehend, but it's a true statement. Now, I know there are many who are Muslims who may not feel that way. Many, perhaps, who do not take, perhaps, their scriptures most literally, but some do. I know there's a lot in our country who believe that, they believe that Islam is not our enemy, and they believe that radical Islams are not, radical Muslims are, are not our enemy. I think it really doesn't matter what they think about radical Muslims as much as it matters what radical Muslims think about us. And whether you think they're your enemy or not, they think you're their enemy. You say, well, Richard, why are you bringing all this up? I'm bringing this up because... Just like Americans have enemies, the truth of the matter is all human beings have enemies. The Bible actually tells us who our enemies are. There's not one single verse that gives us all the enemies that we have, but the Bible does teach. Matter of fact, the book of 1 John lists all three of our great enemies. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 16, two enemies are mentioned. John there lists the world and the flesh as our enemies. In 1 John chapter 3, verse number 8, he mentions a third enemy, the devil. So we've got three enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil. Those are our enemies. By our, I don't just mean Christians. I mean they are the enemies of all human beings. You say, well, I really don't feel like the world is my enemy. As a matter of fact, many people actually believe the world's their friend. There's some folks that couldn't get up and go to church this morning because they were out with the world last night and they're just not able. They party hardy with the world and they think, no, the world's not my enemy, it's, it's my friend. But just like it really doesn't matter that some people are sympathetic to radical Islam, it really matters more what the radical Muslims think. So also, it really doesn't matter what you think about the world. My friend, the world thinks you're its enemy. So also does the flesh... And the devil, you say, well, preacher, how does this work? How can these three 
be my enemies. I want you to get this. The title of the message is remember. I want you to remember this. This is how it works. We've got three enemies. The devil is the mastermind. He's the one who instigates the attacks against you. He's the one with blueprints who designs and creates the attacks. The weapons that he uses against you, that's what sin is. Sin is his weapons. So we've got the devil, our enemy, who's the mastermind. We've got sin, our enemy. That's the weapon he uses. We've got our flesh. Now, you might not believe this, but the flesh is corrupt. The flesh is weak. The flesh betrayed you. It hasn't just betrayed you, it betrays you. The flesh is constantly letting you down. It's constantly yielding to the weapons and to the attacks that Satan brings against you. So here's what you've got. You've got three enemies. They work in harmony together. You've got Satan. He's your enemy. He plans and plots for your destruction. We've got sin. It's your enemy. Those are the weapons the devil uses to destroy you. And you live in this body of flesh, which you would think is your friend, your ally. We're in this together. But no sooner does the attack begin and your flesh lets you down, it betrays you. It gives in and surrenders to the enemy. What is it that this enemy wants to accomplish? I'll give it to you in one word, but I want to elaborate a little bit more. It wants to destroy you. That is exactly what these three enemies are combining to doing. Bible actually gives us many verses that describe this destruction. Let's just pick one enemy and give you a couple of Bible verses. Don't turn, but listen. First Peter chapter five, verse number eight says, be sober, be vigilant because your adversary, that means your enemy, your adversary, the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. That means destroy. So this is the same writer as the book that we're reading from right now. Peter, and Peter says, you've got an adversary, you've got an enemy. He's the devil and he's walking about looking for weaknesses, looking for ways to, to destroy you. Talking about that same one, Jesus made this statement. John 10, 10. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. What did the devil come to do? He came to kill. He came to steal. He came to Destroy. What's the goal of the enemy? The goal of the enemy, as it always is, is to destroy you. You've got three enemies. You need to remember this. The three enemies. You've got Satan. He's the mastermind. You've got sin. It's the weapon. You've got your flesh. It's the traitor. What do these three enemies combine to do? They combine to destroy you. You need to remember, we have enemies. Again, I don't want to be political. I don't qualify to be too political. I'm a little concerned about our country for various reasons. One, I don't think we take serious some of the enemies that we've got. And I understand you can't, you can't take a religion and fight it like you could a nation. I, I get that. But it concerns me that too many folks don't seem to think there's a real threat against our nation. But again, that's not my field of study. That's not my field of expertise. As much as it bothers me as a nation that some aren't taking our enemy seriously, it bothers me even more that some human beings aren't taking our enemies very seriously. You say, oh, preacher, you're one of those Christian guys. Yeah, you take the enemy very serious. You think the enemy's after you. Friend, I don't just think he's after me. I think he's after everybody. It doesn't matter whether you're saved or lost, whether you're a believer or a doubter, whether you're God's or whether you're not, whether you want to believe or don't want to believe. I'm telling you, you've got some enemies. The Bible tells you who they are. And there's a way they work against you. Satan is the mastermind. Sin is the weapon and your flesh will betray you. We have enemies. Remember that. Number two, we need to remember exactly what the enemy wants to do to us. Exactly. Now, I've already given you that one big word. Well, they want to destroy you, but that's a big word. That's, that's all encompasses. What would these three enemies like to do to you today if they could? 
I'll give you four things. Number one, they would like to damn your soul to hell. These four, excuse me, these three enemies, Satan, mastermind, sin, his weapons, even your own flesh would like to damn your soul to damnation. You say, oh, preacher, there you go. You're being melodramatic. You're, you're over the top. Well, let's think about it for a moment. We've already read Bible verses that tell us plainly what the devil wants. He walks about as a roaring lion. Well, what's a roaring lion want to do? He wants to destroy you. What does that mean? Well, it means he wants to damn your soul. Why in the world is the devil... Are, what did I ever do to him? I mean, I've never even seen him. Uh, I was born hundreds, thousands of years after the devil was dealt with by God. Why is he my enemy? understand there's a reason why the devil hates you. Whether you're saved or lost, he hates you. He hates you because God loves you. And that, to him, is all the reason that is necessary for him to want you to be cast into that bottomless pit. Simply because God loves you. It's bad when people treat you a certain way simply because you're affiliated with somebody. Christians are real bad about that. Oh, you go to that church. You're one of those. I got news for you. Just because you go to a certain church doesn't mean you're one of anything, all right? But it's, it's assassination by association. That's what some folks refer to it. it. It's a shame. But the devil has chosen to hate anybody that God loves. I got news for you. He loves us all. So it doesn't matter whether you're in or out, saved or lost. The devil wants to damn you. Why? Because God loves you. But it's not just the devil. Sin wants to damn you. As a matter of fact, there's only one thing sin can do for you. Title of message, remember, you need to remember this Bible verse. You know this Bible verse, but you need to remember it. Romans chapter 3, verse number 23. Simple little verse. For the wages of sin is death. Can't be more simple than that. For the wages of sin, it says, what does that mean? That means you sin, you get paid a price. What's the price? You always get paid if you sin. Death. What's death? Death is separation from God. Death is separation. Separation from God. What does sin always, always do? What's sin's ultimate goal? Always. It's to separate you from God. It's to kill you. It's to damn your soul. I'm telling you, you got three enemies. The devil wants to damn you because God loves you. Sin wants to damn you because that's all sin can do for you. You say, when I preach of my own flesh, <laughs> my own body, my own flesh, surely it doesn't want to damn me. It doesn't want to go to hell. Surely it doesn't. Let me remind you of some verses that Jesus gave to us. Don't turn, just listen. Matthew 18.8. Jesus makes a very astonishing statement. Matthew 18, 8. Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut them off and cast them from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life halt or maimed rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. And if thy eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life, eternity, with one eye, rather than having two eyes to be cast in the hell fire. That's an astonishing statement. It confuses a lot of people. A lot of folks say, well, God wants me to hack my body to pieces. No, He really doesn't. He really doesn't. He's trying to make you understand just how much your flesh is working against you. Isn't it amazing? Some of us guys, we've been fighting it for all of our lives. Before we know it, that eyeball sees some flesh and it starts to follow it. Some folks with their hands, I mean, they don't want to steal. They just, they don't. But before they realize it, their hands done got in the till someplace or, or picked up something, got involved in something that it really should not have gotten involved in. Our feet, hey, they've been on the bottom of our legs all of our life. They ought to know where to go and where not to go, but sometimes they just find themselves walking out into trouble, walking out into sin. What's Jesus trying to tell us? He's trying to tell you, you've been betrayed by your own body. Your own flesh is trying to lead you into the very pits of hell. It said, said it would be better for you if you could to cut off your, your legs, cut off your hands, pluck out your eyes. It would be better to get rid of that flesh than let that flesh lead you into the pits of hell. It's, what's he telling us? Your own flesh wants to damn you. And by the way, your own flesh will take you to hell if you let it. 
because that's exactly where it's leading you to go. We've got enemies. What is the goal of it? It's to destroy. Exactly what does that mean? It wants to damn us. These three enemies working in unison want to send us all to hell. Number two, what do they want to do to us? They want to make us miserable. These three enemies, they want to make us miserable. They want to destroy everything in your life that gives you peace and joy and happiness. These three enemies, you say, preacher, no, 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 can't be. These three enemies, they want to destroy your family. These three enemies, they want to destroy your career. These three enemies, they want to destroy your health. They want to destroy your, your peaceful mind. They want to destroy relationships. They want to destroy anything in your life that gives you peace and happiness. You say, preacher, surely not. Not these three enemies that you're describing. Well, the Bible makes it pretty clear that they are. Let me give you some, some sins. And, and you just think about it for a moment. What do these sins do for us? Adultery, pornography, lust. Think about those three sins. Adultery, pornography, lust. You know what those three, three sins can do? They can destroy your home. Those three sins can destroy your home. How about these three? Jealousy, rage, envy. Jealousy, rage, envy. You know what those three can do? They can destroy relationships. Do it quite often. How about these? Addiction to liquor and addiction to drugs. What can they destroy? Well, they can destroy your health. How about these? Worry, prayerlessness. What can they destroy? They can destroy your peace. They can destroy your joy. Now, I could go on. I could go on. But what I want you to see here is, I want you to see some things in common. Every one of those words that I just mentioned, adultery, greed, lust, worry, all those things, you know what they are? Number one, they're all sins. Every one of them are sins. What does that mean? That means they're weapons used to destroy you. Not a one of those things is good. There's no way you can worry and come out on top. There's no way you can be jealous and come out on top. There's no way you can be addicted to liquor or to drugs and come out on top. You can't. Those are sins. What do sins always do? They always destroy you. They're weapons used to destroy you. Something else that's true about every one of them. They're all habits of the flesh. They're things the flesh likes. You know why people worry? People say, I can't help it. You could do you didn't want to do it, you wouldn't do it. You know why you do it? You like doing it, all right? That's, that's why you do it. You know why folks drink? They don't drink because somebody got a muzzle and stuck a funnel down their throat and forced it down. No, they did it because they wanted to. They did it because they want their flesh wants to do those things. Every one of those sins are sins of choice. Somebody says, I can't help it. I'm an adulterer. I, I watch Pernod. You could help it. You could. The reason you keep doing it is because you want to do it. I'm just showing you. All of these things I'm telling you, they're all sins. They're weapons used against you. They're all friends of the flesh. They're done because the flesh has betrayed you. It wants to destroy you, to take your happiness. And every one of them are designed and sent your way because the devil says, I know what it will do to him. I know what it will do to her. Tell you something else about all these things. You get engaged in them and every one of them will make you miserable. Now, it's the way sin works. It always starts out, it's a little tantalizing. It always starts out, it's a little bit of fun. It always starts out, hey, I got control of this. For long, my friend, it's done beat you up one side down the other and it has robbed you of your family. It's robbed you of your friends. It's robbed you of your health. It's robbed you of your finances. It's robbed you of everything that you ever wanted in life, and you're left miserable. Why are you miserable? Because those enemies, Satan, the world, the flesh, want to make you miserable. Could I just talk to you who are believers? I'm telling you, these are enemies of everybody, saved and lost. But those of us that are Christians... If you keep playing around with those kinds of things, you keep playing with the enemy, fraternizing with the enemy, you're going to wind up living a lonely, miserable life. A lot of folks read the, the thou shalt nots in the Bible and they say, God's trying to steal my fun. God's not trying to steal your fun. God's trying to keep you from making some mistakes that you'll regret the rest of your life. When God tries to tell you don't, He's the one who's designed it. He sees the whole picture. He sees what these things will do to you. He's trying to put some roadblocks up in your life so that you won't die a lonely old or young 
Let's face it, some folks don't live to be old and have regrets. They die young. But he's trying to help you so that you won't die alone and miserable. Why? Because these three enemies, they want to send you to hell. These three enemies, they want to make you miserable. Number three, what are they doing? They're destroying us. That's the big picture, but what are they doing? Well, they want to make us miserable. They want to send us to hell. Number three, they want to ruin our reputation. Now, in Christian circles, we call it our testimony. But these three enemies, they want to ruin your reputation. Why does the devil want to ruin your reputation? Well, if you're a, a Christian and you're trying to help people, you're trying to lift people up. The platform that you have to stand on is always your testimony. It's your reputation. I've been pastoring this church for 30 years. Some folks think I'm crazy. They're more right than they are wrong. But some folks have some monicum of respect. They say, well, at least Brother Hall's never done this. He, he believes this. He does this. He stands by this. 30 years, that's testimony. Because I've got a testimony, I can go some places and say some things to some folks. And instead of them punching me in the nose, they listen. I'm standing on a platform. I've lived a life. That platform that I stand on is my testimony. Anybody that wants to help somebody else up, you've got to have something solid to stand on. It's your testimony. I'm telling you, believer... You need to live holy. You need to live straight. You need to live true. Why? Because that's the only way you're ever going to be able to pull anybody else up is to have that platform. The devil wants to destroy my testimony. He wants to destroy your testimony, your reputation. Kind of interesting in the world that we live in today. You want to help anybody up, you've got to stand on a testimony platform. But it's amazing to me how many people have no testimony. They can't help anybody up. It's just amazing to me how many folks will follow them down. I mean, you, you got no testimony. You can't help anybody up, but you should. It's amazing how many folks will follow a person down. <laughs> Look at Hollywood. I mean, have you ever seen such a bunch of misfitted folks in all your world? Uh, you got dope addicts, drunkards. You've got pedophiles. You've got uh, liberals like nobody's been. You got transsexuals, bisexuals. I, I didn't know you could put all those words in front of the word sexual. I mean, we've, we've created all kinds of monstrosities. Yet, we, and I talk about believers, we will pay them money to go listen to their music and watch them perform shows. There's something wrong with that. Mm -hmm. They're not helping you up, friend. They're helping you down. I don't understand. Memorial Day, day when we're supposed to Stop and be thankful. Recognize those that have died for God. I can't imagine anybody who knows what Memorial Day is going to a football stadium of a football team, paying money to go in that football stadium, and those players not even stand up for the national anthem. Friend, I'm telling you, if you understand what Memorial Day is, you ought not give a dime of your money to, to go see them or to watch them on TV. Something's wrong. What's happening? They're not helping us up. They're helping us. Up. You don't have to have a testimony to help somebody down. But I'm telling you, if you want to help somebody up, you've got to have a testimony, a reputation. The devil, the enemies, want to destroy your reputation. What do they want? To, well, they want to destroy you. They want to send you to hell. They want to make you miserable. They want to ruin your reputation. Number four and last of how they destroy us, they want to end your life. These three enemies, you need to remember, the three enemies, don't forget them. Who are they? This the devil. He's the mastermind. It's sin, that's the weapon. It's your own flesh. It has betrayed you. These three want to end your life. The devil wants you dead. It doesn't matter whether you're saved or lost. The devil would just soon you be dead today. You say, why would the world, would the devil want to kill me? Why would he want me to be dead? If you're a Christian trying to live right, he wants you to be dead so you won't be a thorn in his side anymore. All right, nothing, nothing more that the devil would delight than to take every believer that believes in Jesus Christ and kill him. You remember what he did when Jesus was being born? He didn't just kill, try to kill Jesus. He killed every baby in the neighborhood. Why? Death's nothing to him. He wants to eliminate the problem, and the problem is the believers that are trying to live a righteous life. But I got news for you. If you're one of his best followers, he wants you dead too. You say, why? I'm a drunk. I'm an alcoholic. I'm a pervert. Why would God want me dead? He doesn't want you to flip. If he can end your life right now, while he's got you... It can't get any better for him. It can only get worse. He'd just soon slay you right now whether you're on his team or not on his team. Why? If you're on his team, you'll stay on it then. If you're not on his team, you won't be a thorn in his flesh anymore. The devil wants you dead. Sin wants you dead. Remember that Bible verse. Romans 3, 23. For the wages of sin is death. What is, what is 
sin want to do it? It wants to kill you. Every weapon that the devil uses has a sharp, lethal point on the end. And it's dipped in poison. It wants to kill you. You say, well, preacher, surely my flesh doesn't want to kill me. Well, you think about it for a moment. Isn't it kind of strange that everything that's good for you, we don't like? And everything we don't like, it's not, everything we don't like is good for us. Everything that's good for us, we don't like. Not saying it exactly right, but let's put it this way. Do you like to eat good food? Here is Memorial Day. How many of you went out and got broccoli and ate broccoli for your Memorial Day? Nobody did. What what did you go out and get? You went out and you got your steak and and hot dogs and hamburgers and and, and probably got you some apple pie and maybe some ice cream and and, and you ate all the... Why don't we eat good on holiday? Because we don't like it, all right? I mean, go buy a T-bone steak, take it out of the little styrofoam, styrofoam package, and if you want to eat it, eat the styrofoam and throw the steak away. The styrofoam is probably better for you than the steak is. But we don't eat it. Why? Because it tastes terrible. How come the body don't like to eat good? Flesh has betrayed you. How many of you got up this morning and said, I can't wait to go exercise? Man, I'm going to get a hundred push-ups in before I get dressed today. I'm going to do me some sit-ups. Nobody did. I hope. <laughs> Might be one or two looms in the place, but the body don't like to exercise. Why doesn't the body like to exercise? It wants to kill you. The body likes the things that end your life. It doesn't like the things that prolong your life. I'm telling you, you got three enemies. You need to understand. You need to remember the day. you got three enemies. The devil's against you. Sin is against you. Your own flesh is against you. These three are conniving and they want to end your life. What do we need to remember today? Well, number one, we need to remember we got some enemies. Number two, we need to remember what these enemies want to do for us. How they want to destroy us. Number three, we need to remember what our weapons are. We've got two. We, the human race, has two weapons that we can use to defeat the devil, sin, and the flesh. First weapon we've got is salvation. Jesus wasn't just kidding when in the book of John, chapter number 3, He said, you must be born again. He wasn't kidding. He meant that. You must be born again. If you're not born again, guess what's going to happen? The devil's going to win. Sin's going to win. Your flesh is going to win. You are going to die. You are going to be miserable while you're alive. Your testimony will be in shreds and you will go to hell. When Jesus said you must be born again, He was just putting it right out there where the rubber meets the road. Jesus was kind of blunt. I I tell folks I'm blunt. I, I don't try to be unkind. I do try to be easily understood. I don't want you to have second thoughts. Well, did he mean that salvation is an option? No, it's not. I don't mean that. Jesus did. You must be born again. If you don't, the enemies win and you lose. Now, I know some folks say, well, I tried religion. It didn't work for me. I'm not talking about religion. I'm talking about a relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, the only way, the only way You can defeat the devil. The only way you can nullify sin, the only way you can get dominion over your own flesh is by salvation. Paul wrote in the book of Romans, chapter number 1, verse number 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. What did he call salvation? It is the power power of God. What does this power do? It defeats your enemies. It defeats the devil. It defeats sin. It defeats your own flesh. Number one, our weapon. Essential salvation. Number two, our weapon. Essential sanctification. Sanctification. Lost my monitor for a second. Let me find the Bible verse. John 17, 17. Jesus made the statement while he was praying for us. Sanctify them through thy truth. 
Thy word is truth. Sanctification. What's sanctification? Sanctification is separation from sin and dedication to God. Jesus said, sanctify them. Separate them from sin. Dedicate them towards the things of God. Now, listen to me real careful. Sanctification is not separate from salvation. The only way you can be sanctified is to first be saved. It's not separate. It's part of the package. But your salvation is not complete in its power unless you've also surrendered to be sanctified. I don't know if that makes sense or not. They're not two separate things. They do two totally separate things. But they're part of the same work. These two things together give us victory. You can be saved and still be subjected to the devil's demise. You can be saved and still be engaged in sin. You can be saved and your flesh still be betraying you. Salvation saves your soul. Sanctification gives your body your flesh, the victory it needs. You can't get sanctified without getting saved. But you haven't got the, fur, the full effects of your salvation unless you also are sanctified. I don't know if that makes sense or not. We don't use the word sanctified much anymore. It's like so many other words. Some other denominations have scared us from using it. That's our fault, not theirs. My friend, sanctification is a good biblical word. And matter of fact, it is an essential for the Christian to have victory over his enemies. And just because somebody else preaches it, maybe with a slightly different slant, is no reason for us not to adhere to what the Scriptures say. The Bible says, be ye sanctified. And God's people need to understand, once you get born again, you're supposed to come out of this world. You're supposed to come out of sin. You're supposed to be different, dedicated to God. And if you don't sanctify yourselves, you may go to heaven when you die, but the three enemies are still going to work you over something fierce while you're on this planet. And there's no need for it. These two weapons together give us victory over all three of our enemies. Over the devil, over sin, and even over our own flesh and its carnal desires. What are the weapons that God has given to us to help us defeat these enemies? Salvation sanctification. That's how the message is, remember. Peter started this off. He says, I'm not telling you something you don't already know. He says, my goal, as long as I'm here, is to stir this thing up, is to remind you. Remind me what? I got some enemies. Remind me what? This is what it wants to do to me. These enemies. Remind me what? God's given me some tools, some weapons, so that I can be victorious. This morning, while we remember those that gave their all for us that we might have this country that we live in, let us scripturally remember we're still fighting the fight. And if we're not fighting it with God's righteous weapons, we're going to lose to our enemies. Would you pray with me, please? Father, I thank you for the opportunity to preach. I thank you for the people to preach too. I thank you for their attention. Lord, here it is, a big holiday. We've got guests that have come in from church. It must, must mean, God, that they want to be here. They want to worship you. They want to hear from you this morning. We've got our own people. Many of them probably could have gone somewhere else, been with family today, but they're here. God, they must have wanted to worship you. They must have wanted to hear from heaven. Now, God, I pray that you'd accomplish your will and your work in our lives this morning. Stir us. Oh, God, there's anybody here that's not saved. Lord, still under the domain of Satan, I pray that you'd rescue them today. I pray that they'd grab the life rope. I pray that they'd grab a hold of the cross. Lord, for the Christian, truly saved, truly been born again, but God not yet decided to get the full victory, to feel the full effect of salvation, I pray this morning you'd convince them of that need. Deal with our hearts. Accomplish your purpose. And we'll give you the praise for what you do, for we ask it all in Jesus' name.